Good morning and thank you for the opportunity to speak at this seminar. I'm glad to be here. My name is Sarah Hamlin and I'm going to speak about some of the tools, resources and techniques that we use in the preventive conservation team at the British Library to help us care for collections. One of the biggest challenges we face when ensuring effective custodianship of collections is how we balance our current users' needs with the need to preserve collections so they can be used by future generations. We need to balance demands as best as possible and regardless of the size of our respective institutions or the collections that we manage, we tend to share a common theme. There is never enough time, staff or resources available to do everything we need to do. Therefore, we need systems and processes to help us effectively manage risk to collections throughout their lifetime, whether in storage, transit, display or use. We use the 10 Agents of Deterioration, a framework developed in Canada during the 1990s and now used worldwide to assess risks to cultural heritage and understand how best to manage them. It's a flexible and easily understood way to evaluate risks to an individual item, a collection, a building or an entire site. We've also found it useful to use this framework as a way of underpinning our work, evaluating activities, conducting options appraisals and planning and delivering projects. You may already be familiar with the 10 agents and have heard more about them at this seminar. I think of them as three distinct but interlinked categories which all have an impact on collection care. Firstly, events such as fire, floods or pest outbreaks. Secondly, the environment in which we store, use and display our collections, including light, contamination and pollution levels, temperature and relative humidity. The last category relates to using collections and includes physical forces and accidental or deliberate damage or loss. There were originally nine agents until dissociation was added. I tend to consider this alongside use in my context, but the other two categories can be a factor too. Dissociation could include inadequate metadata, misfiling or losing collection items, or items that have been dispersed or destroyed. Each agent can have various causes and its impact can vary depending on your organisation, location, site and collection. This variety makes it a very flexible framework against which to evaluate risks. I'm going to share two examples of how we've used these at a high level. Firstly, when I evaluated three separate buildings against the 10 agents to see how they compared and which risk factors were most significant. Assessing in this way does not mean there's an imminent risk of damage and doesn't mean that one of the other categories may not be problematic too. It helps us though to identify where we should focus our efforts. The first building on the left is a purpose-built high-density store with robotic retrieval and no staff access to the storage void. The conditions suit collections rather than human comfort. Collection items are retrieved and moved between sites on most days, but have item level identification. In this case, the most significant risks relate to physical forces, and again, it's not a high risk, it's a moderate risk. The second building is a purpose-built public building designed to address many of the agents of deterioration. However, many reading room services are available on this site. So the most significant risks are user related, specifically from physical forces, dissociation and thieves and vandals. Again, somewhere around the middle, moderate risks. The last building is a repurposed building that was initially part of a munitions factory. It housed a low use collection, so relatively few staff need to access it, but consisted of single glazed windows, doors that opened directly onto the outside and an aging roof. In this case, there were significant concerns about the fabric of the building. I colour coded the assessment into traffic light ratings using red to identify the highest rates, risks, amber for the medium and green for the lowest, so the results are easy to interpret visually. From this we would focus on the risks from physical forces and the need for careful handling in the first two buildings. Where there are reading rooms and collections are moved, we would widen this to highlight risks from mutilation, loss and disassociation. 
With the last building, we would be working with our estates team to see how we could improve the physical integrity of the building and the environment within it. One of the simplest ways of ensuring that the 10 agents underpin our work was by incorporating them into our work programme. The preventive conservation team focus on four main themes disaster preparedness, collection care awareness, housekeeping and integrated pest management and environmental monitoring. All our ad hoc activities generally fit into one or several of these themes. There are several advantages to this approach. It's easy to explain to colleagues and stakeholders. We can make a direct link between risk to collections and our work, which holds us accountable for the responsibilities that we have. While priorities may change yearly, we do not lose sight of individual risks. Lastly, each team member is either responsible for one of these four themes or works on one or more of these programmes. I'll use two case studies, updating disaster preparedness measures and collection care awareness to illustrate how we use risk management in various ways to support our work. A colleague and I undertook a significant review of our salvage procedures in 2015, replacing hard copy folders with simplified content accessed via shared phones. PDF files are colour coded in terms of urgency to aid use in an emergency. From information about procedures, roles and responsibilities, green, to initial priorities if contacted about an incident, amber, to actions you need to take to protect or remove incidents at risk during an incident, red. The first COVID lockdown in the UK in March 2020 challenged this system. We could no longer swap phones and everybody was at home. Some salvage team members had joined the team just before lockdown and would be completing induction without access to the building, equipment or collections. We wanted to make sure that everybody stayed in touch and felt as supported as possible during this unprecedented time. I worked with another colleague to review our whole approach and use the time to run some at-home training that turned into 10 themed exercises around topics such as fires, floods, decision making and practical salvage recovery. Salvage team members could respond in any way that they wanted and we shared thoughts after each couple of exercises. We used easily accessible resources, articles, videos, excerpts from book chapters and diagrams and collated team members' feedback into an action plan. Feedback gathered from old and new team members was invaluable. When we returned to the site, I was able to develop the induction programme further. I divided the process into small modules which included a mixture of site visits, training sessions and self-guided exercises. The first session is on decision making, where I run through expectations, what should happen in an emergency and what has happened in previous incidents. This approach reinforces the unpredictable nature of incidents and the need to be flexible. Feedback suggests that this builds confidence and understanding. The individual exercises allow team members to develop their knowledge about salvage procedures and gain greater familiarity with the site at their own pace. Again, feedback suggests that this makes them more confident and because the induction process takes longer, it allows them time to ask questions and provide feedback. Collection salvage measures fit in with corporate emergency procedures and are based around the fact that the library is large, unique and may be affected by any number of scenarios, both large and small. For that reason, our procedures are flexible, so we focus on providing tools and resources to help and support team members in an emergency and understand they won't necessarily be able to follow prescriptive guidelines. Building on our experience with COVID, we've replaced our salvaged phones and team members can now access the same content securely on their own devices. This means guidance is always at hand. We've incorporated advice from others where it supplements our own content, such as a salvage pocket guide you can see on the right here, which was published by the Museum of London. We have a range of hard copy resources that people can use. These range from uh, forms that act as prompts in an incident and encourage you to log what's happening, to grab sheets based on format to help identify priority items, to stickers 
which allow you to triage more easily by identifying material that needs to be air dried, frozen, is suffering from mould or needs to be directed towards conservation. Salvage trucks and trolleys were purchased when our London site opened in the early 1990s. We reviewed the contents of the salvage trolleys that we have located around the site in 2019. You can see one on the left here. At the time we replaced redundant items, added LED torches and created response kits in rucksacks containing personal protective equipment and hard copy resources. The majority of the collection does consist of bound volumes and serials and our equipment reflected this. However, we also have many objects, archives and textiles within our collection and we increasingly borrow these for exhibitions. I created a, de a dedicated exhibition salvage truck similar to the one that you can see on the right hand side which contained initial response equipment and also updated some of the trolleys that we have so that these could better accommodate flat objects or artefacts. Increasingly we're also um, picking up on some of the suggestions from the at-home exercise that um, salvage team members made or also from their previous experience when they've worked in other organisations. Pre-Covid most of our salvage team training consisted of in-person group exercises. The image on the right shows an activity where I asked salvage team members to help us restock the trolleys after we'd reviewed the contents. Aside from making the task quicker, it also meant that the team were familiar with the new contents and could easily find the trolleys. We always tried to organise one team-wide scenario exercise each year, but these were time-consuming to coordinate. While it was good to get everyone working together, I realised not everyone thrived in that environment. Lockdown allowed us to think about how training is delivered, and we now offer a range of training and coaching. We still do whole team exercises and in fact we have an exercise plan next month to tie in with our next major exhibition. In contrast, in our smaller gallery where we had a Peddington Bear exhibition last year, we tend to run individual exercises as it's hard to accommodate group activities in there. I will also be asking the salvage team to complete some of the individual exercises that the new team members have done as a refresher for them. This mix and match approach to training is easier to manage and seems to work for all of us and feedback so far has been positive. Collection care awareness was a term I deliberately introduced. I wanted to move away from a narrow view of handling training mainly focused on those who work directly with collections. Instead I wanted to reinforce the idea that we all need to be aware of collection care regardless of role. While people may not all work with the collections, they work in buildings and offices with collections around them. It should be a thread that runs through everything that we do. Having said that, I also wanted to be pragmatic and acknowledge that we must balance business as usual activities with the needs to care for the collection. I designed this diagram to illustrate expected behaviours in different zones based on activity and I built on work that a colleague had done when reviewing our integrated pest management plan to zone the building. On the left hand side we have storage areas with the tightest restrictions in terms of access, environment and acceptable behaviours and on the right hand side we have public areas and catering facilities which have completely different expectations and use. Carrying out this exercise we could see that the areas that can be hardest to manage from a collection care perspective were those in the orange zone which includes mixed office and processing areas and those in the yellow zone which has meeting and seminar rooms. In both of these zones use of areas is mixed. Both zones often contain collection areas but also food, drink, transit route, visitors or the public so we focus on raising awareness of risks in those areas. We've gathered formal and informal feedback from training and coaching sessions over many years. We use the qualitative data to generate statistics and maintain a training register, but find qualitative feedback to be the most helpful. We know that people learn differently. By reviewing feedback, we can think about how we approach training to best meet their needs. When framing the training, we deliberately moved away from presenting handling training to collection care training. 
We want participants to understand the broader risks that the collections can face. We do this by introducing them to the 10 agents of deterioration, explaining how we mitigate them and explaining what we can all do to help reduce risks further. On the right, you can see colleagues working in pairs to look at some samples using a simplified condition assessment template to record the damage they can see and decide what they think caused it. They can then discuss their findings as a group, which acts as a great discussion forum. We can adapt this exercise to discuss whether items are suitable for certain activities, such as use by readers or imaging, for example. We've also moved away from static, one-size-fits-all content for our training sessions and have adopted a more modular approach. We want our training to be informative and helpful for people in their individual roles. We use a core PowerPoint presentation to set the context that we all work in and to introduce the agents of deterioration. We encourage discussion about what people consider to be the most significant risks. This is an excellent opportunity to acknowledge depth of understanding, dispel myths or challenge assumptions. We then add additional content to suit participants um, and often speak to managers in advance to see what they think the key themes are for their staff. This modular approach makes it easier for us to create new training content and develop new co training sessions. For example, we can work with contractors who may be unused to working in a cultural heritage organisation. They may expect collections in stores and on display and act in a certain way, but not expect to sign them in offices. For processing teams, we can highlight how standard office supplies can cause damage to collections or we can raise awareness of our integrated pest management measures. We make sure we build time into all sessions so participants can ask questions or raise concerns. Um, we log these and endeavour to try and follow them up. We've invested time in developing resources that we can easily share with colleagues and users. These include videos, posters and leaflets. Resources like this can be accessed at any time and uh, can act as a refresher and supplement the training and coaching that we provide. We held fewer face-to-face -face training sessions in the year that we filmed a series of collection handling videos, which you can see on the left of the screen. However, we knew that this investment would be worth it because we would be able to reach a wider audience with the videos and we would also be able to incorporate them in our future training. Since COVID, there's been more demand for virtual training, so we now have a hybrid approach that we can use depending on the participants and their needs. We found that we can still include interactive elements in these sessions. They don't replace face-to-face -face sessions. Some people in teams prefer a more informal coaching session or the chance to ask questions and practice, sometimes within their own place of work. At the top right, you can see me at an open day for PhD students uh, where we spoke to them about different parts of the collection and the tools and resources that they could use to help them in their work. Bottom right is a leaflet that we develop predominantly for our reading room teams to support them and supplement the training that we were doing with them. We found it very beneficial to structure our work around the 10 agents and a risk management approach. It did take some time to incorporate this way of working, but now it's an integral part of our day-to-day -day approach rather than something we always have to set up a meeting to discuss or draft a risk assessment to evaluate. We use a variety of informal and more formal templates and find these help us to crystallise our thoughts and record decisions. We can use these to form the basis for discussions and negotiations for others and the fact we're recording this hopefully helps those who come after us to understand why we made certain decisions. Presenting and discussing options in terms of their risks or advantages and disadvantages can, and incorporating various perspectives helps us to have constructive neutral discussions. We've also found it helps as a framework to disentangle what can sometimes seem like insoluble problems. I have three main lessons learned that I'm sure won't surprise you. The first is around the value of effective communications, especially with those who don't necessarily share your views or who are facing different constraints. It can require an investment and effort to build better relations, but the benefits are many.
It has enabled us to build consensus and anticipate and resolve issues, which has also helped us to have better relations with people in our normal everyday work. We've also unexpectedly found allies who share our views um, and have also found it easier to manage differences in opinions. Secondly, by using a risk-based approach, we're better at prioritising demands and understanding where we need to spend our time and effort. We can decide whether we need a formal risk assessment or options appraisal to present information to senior stakeholders or can produce simple guidelines, provide reassurance or deliver some training. Lastly, looking back at where we do spend time, we prioritise activities that allow us to better support colleagues to perform their roles and support the wider organisational aims. This applies to our media colleagues as well as for the wider library, users and stakeholders. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak to you today.